I am Pragati Praveena from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I will present our work in the space of robot teleoperation. This talk is divided into four parts. Through this talk, I want to introduce a novel way of providing feedback to a user who is remote operating a robot. In robot teleoperation, a user controls a robot from a distance, especially so that they can work in remote, high precision or hazardous environments. During teleoperation, it is important to provide details about the remote environment to the user. For example, in this case, the user receives visual feedback from a camera on the robot. Designing force feedback is particularly challenging. For example, if we want to communicate to the user how hard the robot grasps an object or how heavy the object feels. One approach is to use highly specialized devices that can give the user a sense of the properties of objects in the remote environment. In this system, forces are measured or estimated in the remote environment, and these forces are applied to the user's body or arm through the force feedback device. There are a range of such force feedback devices that can improve user experience and task performance. However, there are also challenges with using these devices. Sometimes, the force feedback can be unstable and results in unsafe operation. They can also be bulky or fixed to the ground and thus restrict the user's natural range of motion. Can we use an alternate complementary approach to convey such force information? In this work, we look at an approach introduced by Anatole Lacouille called pseudo-force feedback, where force feedback is simulated using vision. For example, here, the touchpad surface that the user is pressing down on with the stylus is actually very stiff. But by visually changing the deformation of the virtual surface, the user feels that the touchpad surface is elastic. Prior work has looked at using pseudo-force feedback for such desktop and virtual reality interfaces, but it has not been applied to a robot teleoperation scenario. So in this work, we share our initial evaluation of pseudo-force feedback for robot teleoperation. Our work uses an implementation of teleoperation called mimicry control. The user's hand movement is tracked in real time and the robot mimics their movement. During regular teleoperation, the user can control the robot by moving their arm. The robot closely follows the user's motion. This means that as the user moves their hand a certain distance, the robot's end effector moves by a similar distance. When we want to communicate a larger weight, the robot moves slower. Thus, to move the robot by the same distance, the user has to move their hand by a larger distance. Why might this work as a cue to communicate weight of objects? During teleoperation, the user receives feedback from two senses. First, the robot movement that the user sees through their visual sense. Second, the user's proprioception, which gives them a sense of where their arm is in space. During regular teleoperation, these two feedbacks are consistent. However, in the scenario where we add the cue for weight, the movement of the robot differs from the user's input, and thus we create a conflict between the information from the two senses. Through the remainder of this talk, I will refer to our cue as the motion cue because variation in the motion of the robot causes the sensory conflicts. Drawing from prior work, we design our motion cue such that the robot lifts a heavy object slowly. We manipulate the motion of the robot only in the direction of weight, which is a vertical direction. Here we see a graph of the vertical velocity of the user's hand in blue and the robot and effector in green as a user lifts the object vertically. The lift motion consists of three phases. As we go through the different phases, please follow along with the video on the right. Phase one starts just as the grippers close around the object. In phase one, we simulate inertia. The robot moves very little compared to the user's input, thus exhibiting resistance. In phase two, the robot moves faster than in phase one, but still less than the user input. This corresponds to a lower lift velocity. In phase three, the motion cue switches off and the robot is in regular teleoperation mode. The robot motion in the different phases is determined by the equations on the right. This factor G, which we call the gain factor, allows us to generate cues for a range of weights. 
A gain of 1 means regular teleoperation and lower the gain, larger the weight. In this section, I'll be posing our three research questions and a subset of our results from the user study with 10 participants. Let's start with the first research question. Will participants report perception of weight without explicitly being asked about it? To test this, in our first task, participants lifted two beanbags with identical weights. One of the bags was simulated to be heavier with our motion cue for weight. Participants repeated this lifting three times and freely described any differences they experienced when picking up the two objects. We found that eight out of 10 participants reported the effects of the motion cue. For example, that they needed to make more effort to grab the cute bow. But only two participants attributed this difference in robot movement to difference in object weights. The rest thought that the difficulty of movement was due to lack of practice or bad positioning. The second research question is about the mechanism of the cue. Is the cue only a visual cue and based on the user watching the robot's motion, or is it dependent on the conflict that we create between the visual and proprioceptive senses? To test this, in the next task, we had two conditions. One where the participant controls the robot and the other where the participant only watches a video of the robot movement. We call these conditions controller and observer conditions. For each trial, participants lifted two metal cans that look similar and weight the same. We created the perception of a virtual weight by using one of five levels of gain to generate motion cues. Participants were not aware that the cans weighed the same and they were asked to respond as to which can was perceived as heavier. Each participant had 15 trials in each condition. This is a heat map of participant responses to which can was heavier in the two conditions. Controller on the left and observer on the right. In this heat map, if more participants got the answer right, we see darker colors. We see darker colors on the heat map for the controller condition. What we find is that the cue resulting from sensory conflict leads to better task performance as compared to visual cues alone especially when it comes to being able to differentiate between different levels of the cue. Our third research question is whether the motion cue improves task performance and user experience. For this, we designed two tasks. Similar to the previous tasks, the cans used in this task were visually similar and weighed the same. In the first task, participants categorized cans into two bins, recycle or stock, based on the perceived weight of the can. Lighter cans go into recycle, while heavier ones go into stock. In the second task, participants sort four cans from heaviest to lightest. Both tasks have three conditions. In one condition, participants receive a gold standard cue. For example, the cans were labeled with a number indicating the virtual weight. In the second condition, participants receive the motion cue, and in the third condition, they receive no cue. We aggregate the scores for each task and find that in terms of task performance, participants perform better when they receive the motion cue as opposed to no cue. Task performance in the presence of the motion cue is comparable to the performance in the presence of the gold standard cue. However, in the binning task, despite this good performance, participants complained that they did not readily notice the cue in the presence of complex robot movement. In terms of user experience, we found that in the sorting task, the presence of the motion cue significantly reduces workload on the user. This may be because, as compared to the binning task, which was a binary classification, the sorting task challenged participant sensitivity to small differences in perceived weight. I will conclude by summarizing our three main takeaways. Users rely on coupling between visual and proprioceptive feedback. Complex robot movement in teleoperation creates challenges and opportunities for designing cues for pseudo-force feedback. As tasks get more challenging, presence of the motion cue is more valuable to the user by improving their performance and reducing workload. Thank you for your time.